2018 has just begun. The reality is this. You will face challenges. And many of us need spiritual breakthrough. What do I mean by spiritual breakthrough? For example, how many of you struggle? Don't raise your hands now. How many of you struggle with the syndrome of sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess? Do you relate to that? Pornography, confess. Sin, confess. Immorality, sin, confess. Sin, confess. What's the problem? I want to share with you the importance of true repentance that will result in breakthrough. So what's the topic today? Everybody, please read. True repentance brings breakthrough. I know you need breakthrough. Some of you are in a rut. You feel trapped. Perhaps you are in a relationship. Financial trap. All kinds of problems. The principles you will learn about repentance is universal. You can apply that in every situation in your life. So today, I want to talk about Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is one of the few psalms that you know the background. The choir director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. In other words, this psalm was written. You know the background. It's about David. But how many of us remember the repentance of David? We remember his sin. But you and I don't realize the repentance of David. It's an amazing example. In the New Testament, the obituary written by God about David is not, here was a man who was an adulterer, who was a murderer. No. If you look at the life of David, God described him in Acts chapter 13. David is a man after my heart. God says David was a man after his own heart. How can an adulterer, how can a murderer, how can a schemer end up with that kind of commendation? A man after my heart. Many Christians fail to learn how to rebound. When you make a tragic, major mistake, Satan will tell you, you are finished. And you stay down. And many of you have been staying down for the longest time. And God is saying, I want you to understand how to rebound. Repentance is God's way of restoring us. What's the topic today? One more time, everybody. True repentance brings breakthrough. Now, what do we mean by repentance? How important is repentance? Now, before I tell you, I want you to know the story of the background of Psalm 51. Do you recall one day what happened to David? David was a man of God. He loved God. He, he served the Lord for many years. And this is the story. When evening came, David arose from his bed, walked around on the roof of the king's house. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was beautiful in appearance. First mistake, David got up too late. David was living a luxurious life. Remember that quotation, idleness is the workshop of the devil? David was idle. He got up late. Life was too easy. Then he saw a beautiful girl taking a shower. My friend, temptation will come. Temptation is not a sin. But what David should have done is this. Flee temptation. What did David do? He looked. He should have said, that's wrong. You know what he did? He looked. Kept looking. Not running away from temptation. Guess what happened next? David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David should have known by now this woman is married. Not just married, married to one of his key soldiers. 
Uriah. Uriah was one of the faithful, wonderful, amazing soldier, bodyguard of David. He should have known that. What did he do? The Bible tells us David sent messengers, took her. When she came to him, he lay with her. In short, they had sex. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, she returned to her house. In David's mind, one act of indiscretion is okay. You see, it's just a one-night stand. Only one time. It's okay. There won't be any consequences. Ladies and gentlemen, you will learn from the Bible, sin is sugar-coated poison. The consequences are not immediate, but it's poison. It will surely destroy you. David never knew the consequences that's going to follow. It led him to deception. It led him to murder. He had to murder the husband of Uriah. It led his family to disaster. Because when you sin, you don't just sin against people, you also sin against your loved ones. They saw his life. If you look at his family, it became a mess. That was the rut in David's life. He got stuck. He does not know what to do. I remember this quotation, sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay. And let me add, sin will beget other sin. Sin will not just produce other sin. Sin will eventually bear fruit. And you won't like it. Some of you are in that predicament. You think sin is just a simple compromise. So you have this idea. It's okay. Nobody else will find out. And some of us don't know how to repent. And that's why we are trapped. The Lord sent Nathan to David. I praise God for Nathan. David was in a trap. He was in a rut. He was feeling bad. He does not know what to do. He was hiding, protecting his reputation. God sent Nathan. Nathan took a risk. Imagine speaking to the king. So Nathan came up with an amazing story. Nathan said, you know, king, let me tell you a story. One day there was a shepherd. He was very rich. He had lots of lambs, lots of sheep, lots of goats. And beside him there was a poor shepherd. He was so poor, he had only one lamb. He fed the lamb. He took care of the lamb. And then one day a visitor came. The rich shepherd decided to grab the lamb of the poor man, the only lamb he had, and he killed it and gave it to the visitor. When King David heard it, he got so angry. He said, that is horrible. The man who did that should die. He should pay four times. And Nathan said, you are the man. And when David heard this, I praise God. Instead of killing Nathan, he was struck. He repented. My friends, you and I need Nathan. I don't know about you, but I've seen people. They don't see their own sinfulness. They are blind. Do you have Nathan's in your life? I praise God. In my life, I have many Nathan's. I have a group of pastors. We meet every week. They're my D12 members. I have a group of businessmen. We meet. We are supposed to be Nathan's. I praise God for my family, my wife, my children. We have accountability partners. Do you have Nathan? Nathan 
are people, Nathans are people who are not afraid of you and they will tell you the truth. Some of you are leading a life that's headed in the wrong direction. You are trapped. Today's message will help you. You need breakthrough. You have lost your joy. You have lost intimacy with God. You have lost your passion. You need breakthrough. Especially breakthrough from sin. What is repentance? Do you know the first message of John the Baptist was repent? John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first recorded message of John the Baptist. The first recorded message of Jesus. Guess what? Matthew chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, everybody, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first message recorded in the book of Acts by the apostles. Chapter 2, repentance. Chapter 3, repentance. Let me give you an example. Chapter 3. Everybody, please read. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repentance is not an option. It's a command. The Bible says you need to repent. Let me give you an example. What is repentance? Here is God. I turn away from Him. I'm headed in one direction. What is repentance? Somebody tells me, I discover what I'm doing is wrong. It's sin. It touches my mind. It touches my heart. It touches my spirit. I now change direction. When I change direction, I move towards God. What is that called? Repentance. You see, repentance is not just feeling sorry. Let me give you an example. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. Genuine repentance. There are counterfeit repentance leading to salvation. What is counterfeit repentance? But the sorrow of the world produces death. What is counterfeit repentance? You feel bad. Because you are caught. Some people feel bad because they're embarrassed. Their sin became public. So they feel bad. That kind of repentance is not real repentance. Pharaoh, every time he was in trouble, you read the book of Exodus. You know what Pharaoh will say? I have sinned. Tell God to remove the plague. So God removes the plague. Satan will disobey God again. And then he will be in trouble. I have sinned. Tell God to remove the plague. God removes the plague. And then he will say, he will disobey God. Judas felt sorry. He committed suicide. That kind of repentance is counterfeit repentance. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about true repentance. What is true repentance? It leads you to salvation. Repentance, as we know, is basically not moaning and remorse, but turning and change. In other words, it is not just feeling sorry. It's more than that. It's turning. Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ will the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. What do I mean? Repentance is not a one-time event. I know of somebody, when he first came to Christ, the obvious sin, he was convicted, he changed. The womanizing, he changed. But then, as years went by, he discovered he was not treating his wife properly. The way he talked to his children, the way he talked to his wife, his tongue was sharp and painful. He repented. He said, Lord, that is wrong. Then, pretty soon, he discovered some more things in his life. You see, repentance is not just one time. As you walk with God, God will tell you 
What's wrong? You need to change. For example, there are people here, example, I'm going to talk to the wives now. Wives, you may think it is okay to show disrespect to your husband. You may think it's okay to disobey your husband. And then as you walk with the Lord, you realize that is wrong. Gentlemen, you may think it's okay to shout at your wife. You may think it is okay if you just provide money, but you don't show love. You don't prioritize the family. You need to repent of that. I know of young people, I know of teenagers. They're busy in CCF. But at home, they don't respect their parents. At home, they don't obey their parents. My friend, that is not right. And that's where repentance comes in. Once you know this is wrong, you need to change. The Christian life is a series of repentance. I don't know your life today, but all I know is this. Lately, God has convicted me again and again to be careful with my tongue. I need to repent. But if you treat sin lightly, especially the respectable sin. What do I mean by respectable sin? Gossip. You know why some women don't change? Because you think it's a small thing. What are the other respectable sin that you need to understand, you need to repent of? Gossip. What about complaining, grumbling, disobedience? Temper, anger. Why is it some people don't seem to change? You keep losing your temper. You keep shouting at people. You keep lying. Let me tell you why. You need breakthrough. You need true repentance. In the book of Psalm, chapter 51, you learn five things about repentance. What are the five things? Number one, you will learn true repentance is approaching God. Number two, you will learn that true repentance is assuming responsibility, not blaming. Number three, you will learn that true repentance is to accept God's forgiveness. And number four, you will learn that repentance is accepting the consequences of your sin. And lastly, repentance is asking God to change your heart. What's the main point today? True repentance brings breakthrough. Repentance... It's approaching God. It's not running away from God. It's very counterintuitive. Be gracious to me, O God, according to, to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Do you notice the first thing you need to learn? When you commit sin, do not run away from God. God is not angry at you. you got to understand theology. When you make a blunder, you must approach God. That should be your first action. Not run away from Him. Today, many people turn away from God. You either make tampo, you make angry at God because you think God is angry at you. That is wrong theology. I want you, I want you to know something. When David repented, look at his prayer. Be gracious to me. You see, forgiveness is based on God's grace, not because I deserve it. Listen, you and I will never deserve forgiveness. So you come to God. Be gracious to me, oh God. According to your, everybody read, according to your loving kindness. The word loving kindness is from the Hebrew word chesed. Chesed simply means God's promises, God's covenant love. You see, God made a promise to David. God made a promise to you to love us. Yes or no? So you come to God on the basis of his character, his love, his grace. Never, because you deserve it. The world today rejects people who are losers. We don't like people who make mistakes. We turn away from them. But God is different. God is saying, you know what? You come to me. That's repentance. You approach God. So I don't know what you are doing right now spiritually. I don't know where you stand. But I have good news for you. Turn, approach God. Okay, approach God. Notice. According to the greatness of your compassion. Notice, it's about God. He loves you. Turn to Him. And notice the word used. Blot out my transgressions. So repentance is number one, you approach God. 
Don't run away from him. Don't believe Satan when he tells you, you know what? You are so bad. God does not want you anymore. Number two, you have to assume responsibility. What is responsibility? Look at what he said. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. I want you to count the number of times the personal pronoun appears in verse 2 and 3. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. It's assuming personal responsibility. David could have blamed others. You know what David could have done? The reason why I sinned it is because Bathsheba took shower in front of me. What's the problem, David? Because Bathsheba undressed. It's her fault. She should not have undressed when she takes a shower. You see, we love to give excuses. Yes or no? What am I saying? Friends, if you want repentance, assume responsibility. Don't blame others for your sin. We have this amazing habit of blaming others. Notice how he describes sin in three different words. He said, number one, my iniquity. The word iniquity is perversion. David is saying, I'm a perverted person. I'm a pervert. Iniquity. I'm crooked. The next word he used for sin is, this is the word where you have the word hamartia. That's where I'm short of your standard. Lord, I'm not what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a good man, good king. I'm not what I'm supposed to be. The third word for sin is my transgressions. The word transgressions is the word for rebellion. I have crossed the line. I have disobeyed your commandments willfully. Notice what David did. No excuses, no blaming my sin. Friends, you want to experience breakthrough? Accept responsibility. Don't blame others. I remember this couple. We were helping them. And I noticed about husband and wife, when there's a problem, they blame each other. The reason why you blame each other is to wash your hands of your personal responsibility. And when you do that, you are not going to improve. Why? It's your fault. I remember this young man, addicted to games. He won't admit it. Flung out of school three times. Busy in ministry. Began to blame the parents. My friend, that's not repentance. And that's why many young people don't overcome what's causing you. I don't know what's causing you to be tied down. I don't know what's your problem. But this sin, confess, sin, confess syndrome will never be resolved until you assume responsibility. Notice the next verse. David said, Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. David finally understood sin is not just against people. It's against God. He says, against you, you only I have sinned. You know what David is saying? Ultimately, sin is against God. David sins, sinned against Uriah, the husband. He sinned against the family of Bathsheba. Eliam was the son of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was the advisor of David. David sinned against all of these people. But ultimately, he's saying, I have sinned against you. Why is this so important? Let me tell you why. When you think of sin just as horizontal, against my husband, against my wife, against each other, ladies and gentlemen, your repentance will be shallow. 
Because when you think you can get away, and your wife will not know it, your husband will not know it, or people will not know it, you will keep repeating it. But once you realize sin is serious, because it's against God. David said, against you. Against you only, I have sinned and done what is evil. Can I tell you why sin is so serious? I used to struggle with sin, confess, sin, confess syndrome. Then I discovered repentance is the work of God. Repentance is God's grace upon us. He opened my eyes to see the seriousness of sin. I remember my friend whose adultery was discovered by the wife. And he said, Peter, when I saw how it impacted my wife, I saw her curling up in the bed, sobbing, crying because of my adultery. When I saw the pain that I have caused in my wife, I realized adultery is so bad because he loved his wife. You see, sin is ultimately a violation of God's love for you, not just with each other. That's why the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And he prayed a prayer. You know what my friend told me? I prayed to God. Lord, if ever I will commit adultery, you kill me first. But don't allow me to commit adultery. Because I don't want to see what my wife went through. Friends, many times you don't take sin seriously because you think it is just against people. Just think of the impact on the Lord. You know why sin is so serious? Because you sin against God who loves you. You sin against God who is holy. You sin against God who died for you. So for me, sin is serious. It's not just against people. It's against the Lord. And once you take sin seriously, repentance is going to happen. But if you take sin lightly, you don't assume responsibility, you blame people, my friend, you will never change. Look at his humility. David said, he assumed responsibility. He said, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. David is not saying it is sin to be pregnant and to have a baby. He's saying, I was born with a sin nature. What does that mean? Let me ask you a question. Who among you taught your children? When you go to school, I want you to cheat, I want you to lie. How many of you taught your children how to cheat and to lie? Raise your hand. How come our children cheat and lie? Answer. We have that nature. And until you accept the reality of the seriousness of sin in your life, in my life, my friend, you will not take repentance seriously. And then David said, you desire truth in the innermost being. Because David knew he was manipulative. David needed truth. He was not honest. He was manipulating so that Uriah will die in the front line. I, there's no truth in me. Wow, what an honest confession. In the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Lord, I need you to help me make good decisions. And then notice what he said. But when you repent, you must also accept God's forgiveness. Not only do you assume responsibility, you must accept His forgiveness. Look at what He said. Purify me with high soap and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Look at the grammar. Purify me. What is high soap? High soap is a plant in the Middle East, in Israel. They used to use that plant, dip it in the blood, Exodus chapter 12, dip it in the blood and use the high soap, put the blood on the doorpost, and God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will not judge you. So David understood forgiveness comes from the blood. It is a foreshadowing. It is a preview of what Jesus will do someday. Our forgiveness is because of Jesus, not because of us. So when David uses this language, he understood the principle of forgiveness in the Old Testament 
is the animal sacrifice will take your place. You know why? Because God is holy. Sin is serious. So David said, purify me, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Many times, we, don't, we are not willing to accept the forgiveness of God. You know why Satan tells you, you know what? It, it, is not, it is not as simple as that. You think God has forgiven you? My friend, sometimes the hardest person to forgive is yourself. Can I tell you something? When you come to God in repentance, you approach Him, assume responsibility, you must accept His forgiveness. Do you believe God promised to forgive you and He will forgive you? How many of you believe that God will forgive you completely? Raise your hands. Now, how many of you can tell your neighbor, I am completely forgiven? Tell your neighbor, I am completely forgiven. But you know, some of you are not sure yet. You know why you're not sure? You have not repented. I'm going to teach you. Forgiveness is from God. He promised to forgive us. Yes or no? Are you aware He promised to forgive us? If you come to Jesus Christ, He promised because of Jesus because he died on the cross for your sins. I will forgive you because of Jesus. In accordance with your grace, in accordance with your loving kindness, Lord, forgive me. That is the meaning of repentance. You accept his forgiveness. But you know what? Accept his consequences. You know why many times we want forgiveness, but we don't want repentance. We don't want to accept consequences. What do I mean by consequences? Make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. David was not talking about literal broken bones. He's talking about the pain that he went through. David was miserable when he was in sin. In fact, to show you the misery of David, this is what he said in another psalm. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. You see, David said, when I tried, when I hid my sin, when I did not confess, when I did not repent, my body is wasting away. Some of us, some of you are miserable. You have lost the joy of your salvation. Can I tell you why? You need breakthrough. You need repentance. What is repentance? Number one, approach God. What's number two? Assume responsibility. Don't blame others. Number three, accept God's forgiveness. And number four, accept the consequences. Many times, people will not accept the consequences. Let me tell you the story of one of our pastors when I counseled him. When you commit adultery and you ask for forgiveness, will God forgive you? Yes. What's the consequences? The consequences can be very painful. Your children lose their respect. That's painful. Your company may fire you. The pain in your wife will not immediately go away. You see, there are consequences to what we do. But you know what we want? We want forgiveness without consequences. That's not in the Bible. God will forgive you. But accept the consequences. You've got to be humble. True repentance is saying, Lord, it's my fault. Teenagers, you don't study what's going to happen to you. You will flunk. You take drugs, you become addicted. What's going to happen next? you will have a hard time finding a job. And when, you, when you have a hard time finding a job, economically, financially, you'll be in trouble. And that stays with you. That, those are consequences. And then our problem is we blame God. Lord, you are not fair. Lord, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Hello? It's our own fault. Yes or no? Accept consequences. You know, David said, hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. This is a poem. He repeats 
forgive me, Lord. And then you accept God's forgiveness. And then the Bible tells us, you now ask for a new heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Notice, a clean heart. The word create is the same word used in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. That's the same word used, something new. My friends, you and I need to come to God and say, Lord, create in me a new heart. Because repentance is not shallow, it's deep. You know why you keep sinning? The heart. You need God to change your heart. And only God can change our heart. So David prayed, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. And you know what he said? Notice the heart of David. He wants intimacy. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. This is not a theological debate. It's about the manifest presence of God. David wanted intimacy with God. Lord, I want you. I want your spirit. I want your presence in my life. Friend, it is so crucial that you understand the importance of true repentance. You know why? True repentance will result in joy. Look at what he prayed for. A new heart. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. When you repent, you will have breakthroughs. What are those breakthroughs? Number one, a clean conscience. Most of us don't have clean conscience. You are not sure you are forgiven. And to me, another breakthrough, the joy of the Lord. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Why is this so important? Listen to me. When you commit sin, you lose the joy of your salvation. Yes or no? But the other way is also true. The joy of salvation prevents you from sinning. Think about it. For David, the joy of adultery is better than the joy of the Lord. You see, when you neglect the joy of the Lord in your life, when you don't sustain that, when you don't treasure the joy of the Lord, you are bound and prone to disobey God. I've come to a point in my life where I don't want to lose the joy of the Lord. And because of the joy of the Lord, temptation becomes less and less, weaker and weaker. Let me prove to you. How many of you join us this week, prayer and fasting? Raise your hand. Higher again. What did you notice when you were praying and fasting? Temptation was less. Yes or no? Why? Because the joy of the Lord will protect you. But if you don't have the joy of the Lord, you are prone to sin. Husbands and wives, let me tell you something. If husband and wife, if you have the joy of each other, your marriage is joyful, you are less tempted to commit adultery. But if the husband and the wife don't have good relationship, there's no joy in that relationship, I can almost guarantee you, temptation becomes very strong. The joy of the Lord is the heritage of God's people. And you need to learn, you must sustain, maintain, treasure the joy of the Lord. And I praise God that the joy of the Lord is in my heart. I wake up daily thanking the Lord, praising God. You know why? I find it a great joy to walk with Jesus. Because I find it a great joy, why would I settle for counterfeit pleasure? Is temptation real, yes or no? Yes. But you are prone to sin less when you understand the joy of the Lord. And then notice what he said. Sustain me with a willing spirit. You see, you cannot do this on your own. Repentance is the work of God's grace. And then notice the impact, a change heart. A change heart will give you the following impact. I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. You become a blessing. A change heart that has experienced the forgiveness of God will result in you wanting to help others. David said, I will teach transgressors 
your ways. You cannot teach something until you experience it. You can teach, but you won't be affected. Let's welcome Van Alcazar. He will share with us his journey into repentance. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. This is a warning I've read many times as a believer in Christ, but I have not really given it much attention until it was too late. Some 15 years ago, I was comfortable living my life. I had a good family, a successful corporate career, and a flourishing ministry. I was leading my small group, or D12. I was a worship leader, a Bible teacher, and a retreat speaker. I thought I was already standing firm in my faith because I have been a believer for a long time. However, I let my guard down and everything fell apart. One day in the office, I found that a woman whom I had a past relationship with had joined the company. I wanted to tell my wife about this development, but I couldn't muster up the courage to tell her, so I kept it a secret. At first, I kept my distance with this office mate because of our past and the fact that she's now also married. However, soon we began interacting and one thing led to another. My sinful nature took over and I fell into an adulterous relationship. I knew it was wrong, but it seemed that I was too weak to stop. And even if it was a secret affair, I was destroying my relationship with my wife and children, and most importantly, with God. A few months later, God stepped in and allowed my wife to discover my affair. I admitted it to her, and we went to our disciples for help and accountability. I needed help to rebuild everything I had destroyed. When I was in sin, I never really paid attention to the damage I was causing. But when the time for accounting came, I saw the extreme hurt and pain I've caused to so many people. My wife, my children, my D12, our friends, my brothers and sisters in CCF. I had betrayed all of them. Our discipler, who is also our area pastor, helped us in the healing and restoration process. First, I had to stop the immoral relationship. Next, I had to step down as a D12 leader and from all the other ministries where I had a leadership or teaching function. I also had to ask for the forgiveness of my wife and our children. It was heartbreaking for me to see the hurt and the hate in their eyes when I owned up to what I've done. Then I had to personally ask for the forgiveness of my D12 upline and downline and the other people I was accountable to. Of course, I had to acknowledge my sin before God and ask for His forgiveness. I also had to take practical steps to make sure that I protected myself from falling again. This involved me requesting our company president for a transfer of assignment to another company so that I would not have to work or interact with the girl. I was advised to do everything possible to mend my relationship to my wife and children. Our eldest daughter refused to speak to me after I confessed and would practically ignore me at home. She wouldn't reply to my text messages but would course her answers through her mom. When she would leave the house, she would say goodbye to everybody except to me. As a father, that was a heavy punishment, but I knew that it was nothing compared to my sin. One day, she texted me asking for directions how to go to a certain place. That was the only real communication I received from her in several months. It was a trivial question, but I saved that text message on my phone and read it over and over again whenever I missed her. My sin affected my own personal relationship with God. It robbed me of my inner joy and peace. There were times when I could feel God's disappointment with me. I knew God is a merciful and forgiving God, 
but sometimes in my prayer, I was actually ashamed to ask anything from Him. Many times during my quiet time, the Word of God would cut my heart, as if to remind me over and over again the seriousness of the sin I have committed. The restoration process took a few years of regular counseling, accountability sessions, and prayer times. I made myself accountable to my wife, children, and several accountability partners from detail. It was a very difficult journey because I had to show my wife and children that I was really repentant for what I did, and I'm taking all possible steps to protect myself and avoid falling back into sin. By God's grace and with the help of people who really cared, I was eventually restored and gradually reinstated back to ministry. The leadership of my D12 was turned over back to me. Later, I was given opportunities to lead worship and teach Bible again. When I went to God, a broken and repentant man, I experienced His grace and mercy. God indeed is a redeeming God, and He gives us second chances when we fall. And He is still continuously at work in my life. Only He deserves all the glory, the honor, and the praise. You know, when you have a new heart, the breakthrough will be not just teaching others. A life of worship. Look at the breakthrough. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. You notice the sequence? Once you experience forgiveness because you humbled yourself, the next sequence is your mouth will praise him. Now let me ask you, How many of you have experienced the forgiveness of the Lord in such a way that you cannot stop talking about it? The reasons why many of us do not publicly declare the praise of God is very simple. Perhaps, perhaps you have not fully understood the meaning of forgiveness. Now, what is preventing us from publicly declaring the goodness of God. You see, a transformed heart, a renewed heart, you will want to serve Him. And that's what's happening to Van. And then you will want to please Him. A renewed heart, a changed heart, is from God. Only He can change our heart. So I want you to pray sincerely today, through repentance. After accepting responsibility, accepting forgiveness, accepting consequences, I want you to say, Lord, I want a new life, a new heart. For you do not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise, I would give it. You you are not pleased with burnt offerings. In other words, he's not saying these are not good. David could have offered thousands of bulls, thousands of sheep. He's very rich. But he said, Lord, that is not what you really want. My friend... God wants your heart. And David said, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. There comes a point in my life where I was broken. And I've discovered if your heart is broken, you stop focusing on the sin of other people. When people criticize you, It is no longer a big thing. Because when your heart is broken, what people say about you is not important. What is important is God. It's pleasing God. And David said, Lord, what you want is my broken heart. I give you my broken and contrite spirit. And you know, the Lord gave me a promise why brokenness is very important. Some of you have not been broken yet. I guarantee you. You want to be used by God? The process of maturity is the broken process God will incur and do upon your heart. Don't be surprised if people will betray you. Don't be surprised if you're disappointed with life. It's part of the breaking process where you say, Lord, no longer my agenda, no longer about me, No longer my reputation, 
No longer about my rights. Everything is about you. And the promise of a broken heart is simply this. Thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, the eternal God, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place. And also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Can I tell you why I experience revival all the time? I come to God, and I say, Lord, here I am. And when God's presence fills my spirit, I am revived. I am energized. Because God will never despise a broken and a contrite heart. Are you broken by sin today? Practice through repentance. Let me close with the story of a guy by the name of Ron. His name is Ron Bronski. Once upon a time, he was not a pastor. Ron was a gangster. At the age of eight, he tried to kill his mother with a hammer. At a very young age, he was into drugs. He was headed in the wrong direction. That's why he became the top number two man of a gang in Chicago. And one day, one of his friends was attacked by another gang. And he decided to kill the person who did it. He decided to kill the leader of the opposite gang. He got his gun. He waited for them. And when they came out, he discovered it was not the leader. It was the brother of the leader in that particular restaurant. But you know what he decided to do? Still, he will kill the brother. Because by killing the brother, the other brother will go to the funeral parlor. And when they go to the funeral parlor, he will kill the leader. Can you see how distorted his mind was? This guy was vicious. And when he chased the brother of the gang leader, he took him and he shot him. And he shot him at the back. And he fell down. When he fell down, he turned his face, he turned the body around, and the guy was still alive. The guy was pleading, please, please, don't kill me. He cocked the gun right on his head and pulled the trigger. But there was no more bullet. So he had to run because he heard the police car coming. He went to Canada with his girlfriend. And then he went back to the States in Oregon, northeast. Chicago is on, on the western side. You know what happened? His co-workers in the factory were all believers. Many were believers. He came to know Jesus. When he came to know Jesus, he repented. His life began to change. He began to be active in the church. He began to serve the Lord. But one thing bothered him. I am still a wanted fugitive. I need to go back to Chicago. He knew what's going to happen. The minimum offense for that kind of attempted murder, cold-blooded, is 20 years. He told his wife, he told his family, it's okay. I want to do what is right, not what is convenient. Repentance is accepting the consequences, accepting the forgiveness of God, but wanting to please God. That's a new heart. So when he went to the court, there was this lawyer by the name of Lee Strobel. Now, Lee Strobel was an atheist. And he was shocked because in his report, almost everybody in court will plead not guilty, not guilty. They all want to get out of jail. They said, I'm not guilty. Except this guy. This guy went to the courthouse to admit his crime. I am guilty, Your Honor. I did it. I have no excuses. But Your Honor, something happened to my life. The Lord changed me. I am prepared to accept the consequences of my sin. It's okay. Lee Strobel, an atheist newspaper reporter, said, how can a man do that unless Jesus is real. What will make somebody 
go all the way from Oregon to Chicago to admit for a crime that he will never be caught anymore. You know why? There's no more, there's no one looking for him. Just an arrest warrant in Chicago. He could have lived his entire life free. But you see, when you have a new heart, you want the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is doing what is right. It is never a shortcut. And you know what the judge said? The judge said, based on what you did, you are a cold-blooded killer. I ought to sentence you 20 years. But I've studied your case. I know your life. I know you have changed. Therefore, I will sentence you. Go back to your family. Go home. Praise God. Go home. You are placed under probation. And when Lee is troubled, talk to this guy. This guy told him, Lee, I know you're an atheist. But what the judge did for me was to show me grace and mercy. And I experienced that with Jesus. And Lee Strobel said that was one of those incidents in his life that slowly but surely led him to Jesus. My friend, a broken heart will do what's right. Not what is convenient. Let's bow our heads. If God has spoken to you and he wants you to repent, I want you to realize God is waiting for you to turn to him. How many of you would like to respond to the voice of God by repenting today? Raise your hands. Praise God. Higher. There is something in your life you need to repent. Assume responsibility. Accept God's forgiveness. You are troubled. Will you pray privately wherever you are right now? Raise your hands high. And then you pray privately. Accept the reality that you have sinned. Repent. You tell Jesus, Lord, I accept my responsibility. I've sinned against you. Will you forgive me? Will you talk to Jesus with your hands raised up between you and the Lord? Today is a very important day because repentance is lifetime. The day you stop repenting is the day you stop growing. Are there anybody else that God is convicting you, you need to repent? The Christian life is the process of God breaking our idols. And that's why you need to repent daily, sincerely. Anybody else? All right? If you are humble enough to admit you need repentance, and let me tell you, God is looking at your heart. I want to pray for you. So those of you who have raised their hands, between you and God, you stand up. I want to pray for you right now. Stand up. Tell the Lord, here I am. You're accepting your responsibility. You are accepting God's forgiveness. And you're accepting the consequences. And you want to ask God to give you a new heart. So that you don't have this sin, confess, sin, confess syndrome. Learn to see sin as sin. Stand up. Praise God. Many of you. I want to pray for you. I know you are struggling. But the reason why you are struggling is because repentance is the work of the Holy Spirit. Only God can make you repent. You cannot even repent on your own. Will you humble yourselves and respond to God's Spirit? Anybody else? Today will be the beginning of the rest of your life. Praise God. I know God's speaking to some of you and you're struggling. Don't stay in your sin. Don't pretend it doesn't exist. Listen to his voice. Father God in heaven, I want to thank you for this group of men and women, especially those who have stood up. Lord, allow them to experience spiritual breakthrough the breakthrough of a clear conscience 
the breakthrough of joy and the breakthrough of a new heart, serving you, praising you. Lord Jesus, allow each one of us, including myself, to experience repentance, true repentance on a daily basis for your sake, for your glory, and bless everybody here today. That renew our lives, renew our heart, so that our Christianity will not be shallow. Forgive us when we want salvation without repentance. Lord, repentance is not an option. It's your will. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Connect with CCF through the following websites. Jumpstart your spiritual journey by joining a small group. We are so blessed you were able to join us today. God bless and see you next time.